So Trinity. Or the Trinity. Christian theology is especially rich in its expositions on this concept of Trinity. And if for whatever reason um, you do not fully understand the relationship, I doubt very much that one can really, really, truly walk this path, the path of Christianity, because the idea of Trinity were really the essence of the teaching is being held in a beautiful and perfect symmetry. Just to give you an example, and some of you may have seen that famous equilateral. Remember that equilateral? Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Right? Or Father, Holy Spirit, and Son. Whatever the comp composition is, whatever the positioning is. For the, furthermore, there is this very interesting additional pointing is given, which is totally perplexing. Imagine if you drew an equilateral, and at each corner of the equilateral, you drew a circle. And in each of these circles, you will just put the, these terms, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And it says, essentially, on the lines that connect one with the other, not Essentially, Father is not the Son. Son is not the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit is not the Father. And the whole, if you will, diagram is has closed. The whole exposition. Father, Son, Holy Spirit is not, is not, is not. You following me? Mm -hmm. Father is not to be confused with the Son. Son is not to be confused or equated with the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit is not to be equated with Father. You have this completely interlocked relationship. And yet, the Trinity is inseparable. Everything is essentially encapsulated, conveyed through, and rests upon this very architectural principle. Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And you can enter the theological investigations, you can enter the theological dialogues to find out what is it who stands for what. And unless you are really equipped with some insights, perhaps offered in different or some other cultures, it may not be that easy to dismantle here, or rather unravel the true relationship and true connection. What is here stands for what? What does the Father represent here? What does the Son represent here? And what the Holy Spirit represents here? And yet, without understanding this properly, there is, as it were, a kind of, if you will, already not having a proper ground in having that insight into this very, very profound, very profound, spiritual tradition, very profound revelation. 
So this is why I would welcome you to depart and venture into another territory where we can perhaps draw some analogies and some parallels. And that would translate into the categories born, let's say, or the categories within Indian thought, that of another trinity. The trinity of the will, knowledge and action. The so-called Ikcha Jnana Kriya. Will, knowledge and action. Ikcha Jnana Kriya. which in itself is a constituency of being consciousness bliss, Satchitananda. It's the expressive potentiality of pure awareness as the primordial womb of creation. It is very interesting that here, speaking the language that kind of relevant to our sensory perception and organs even, of cognition. Even anatomy of the body. The heart of Shiva is very often also spoken of in the same way as the womb of Shakti. Is that perplexing, kind of maybe even bewildering analogy? The heart of Shiva is equated with the womb of Shakti, the primordial womb. That will, knowledge and action, which essentially translates into the what we then so freely partake and take for granted as the trinity of seer, seeing and seen. This is the Vedic Samhita of Rishi Devata Chandas. This is the equilateral, if you will, geometrically speaking, of that relationship of the seer, seeing and seen. An understanding of the relationship between seer, seeing and seen, it's essentially primal to understanding of all our experiences. All without exception. Doesn't matter how gross, how subtle, intermediate in between, or how whatever highest possible experience there is. that equilateral of see, seeing and seeing is essentially the modalities of pure awareness which allows expressing itself as that what then aware of itself. These are the modalities of self-awareness. This is the primordial womb of Shakti which give birth to absolutely everything. And when we say everything, it's a limitation of the language because it's not just something that is actually have physical form. Everything here means the whole field of pure potentialities. The whole field of pure potentialities. In other words, it's the pure energy. Energy that can take any form and it's a plethora of all that comes into form, 
constantly being assembled and reassembled. And it's that what scientists today in quantum physics speak of as that froth, that foam, the bubbling foam, the bubbling foam at the Planck scale, where universe literally forms with, or rather field of consciousness forms with zillions of universes born per split of a second, even if we have to use the, the kind of measure of, of unit, of time. Because obviously even time itself comes out of that, which is in itself, if we are to borrow now a Vedic analogy, is that field of Satchitananda, being consciousness bliss. The substratum of creation. But from the practical point of view, from practical understanding, it is that what everyone experiences, experiencing now, right now in this room, and at every moment in time. It's that relationship between subject, object, and what essentially connects subject and object as that continuum of experience. It's that Rishi Devata Chandas exemplified in Vedic terminology as that Samhita of Rishi Devata Chanda. Samhita simply stands for the togetherness, something that is together, always together, not apart. Togetherness of Rishi, the seer, Devata, the seeing, and Chandas as the seen. Everything, everything is that, everything. There's Rishi, there is Chandas, and there is Devata. In every experience, on any level, sensory or extrasensory, this relationship is intact. Why is it important in relation to the encoding, the meaning of the Trinity and what it represents here? is because it becomes very intimate rather than a, some kind of abstract, abstract category of theological debate which have to be taken on faith or somehow to decode it. No. Every experience contains Father, Son and the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. Every experience, Father, Son and the Holy Spirit. It's the trinity of that which allows the experience to take place. Without the Father, without the Son and the Holy Spirit, there's no experience. Full stop. <sighs> and now you can see why in Christian kind of maybe cryptic language in that perf perfect symmetry, it is not. Why it is said, it is not. Father is not the Holy Spirit, or Father is not the Son. Son is not the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit is not the Father. There is a respective, specific, specific quality that each of these modalities represent and embody which is distinct and unique. And in the unity or togetherness in that Samhita, that what allows awareness to be aware of itself. Awareness is always aware of itself. Every experience we can speak of is essentially self-referral. Because consciousness is always in reference to its own self, never in reference to something else. Because that is, that is, essentially, a blasphemy of duality. It is essentially, essentially, reducing awareness to an object. Awareness is not an object. Nor is awareness is a subject. There is inherent subjectivity to every experience. 
But we cannot reduce awareness to neither object nor subject. Therefore, that tantric analogy, the heart of Shiva, that quiver within that pure awareness, that heartbeat of the spiritual heart, or, if you will, a more Shakta perspective, the womb of Shakti. <clears throat> what I love about Indian dialogues and some spiritual expositions, I remember when Maharishi Mahesh Yogi was, was, was once asked, so, like, everything essentially culminates in that oneness of Shiva, right? So where Shiva comes from, you know? And uh, Maharishi sat for a moment, mm, from Great Mother Divine. <laughs> so, go figure. Of course, when we operate with modalities of linear thinking, with a dichotomized thought, then that doesn't make sense. Because we want to arrive somewhere. We want to have a point of arrival. But that only belongs to that duality of thinking. It belongs to that process where it requires its opposite. Something, something which can contrast in order for us to understand that what is being contrasted. And of course, why that falls flat when we arrive to this highest categories? Because this is why the spiritual practice, revelations and unfoldment is constantly, constantly accompanied by paradoxes. But going back to Trinity, this essentially, if we are to understand the profound depth, whilst at the same time simplicity of that relationship, you have a handy, essentially, knowledge available in other cultures where you can decode or uncode that what Holy Trinity stands here for. Where, essentially, the spiritual progress, we could say, the spiritual unfoldment, follows also a certain, certain trajectory of how one category, essentially, is temporarily gaining its momentum, so as it to drive the process. So therefore there is the importance of the Holy Spirit, the importance of the Father, the importance of the Son. The importance of subject, object, and that what is exemplified here through the quality of Devata, the seeing. And just as a kind of helpful, perhaps, aid in terms of, uh, on a practical level, when objectivity dominates our awareness, when objective experience of the world dominates our awareness, the subject essentially is lost. The subject is lost in the object of experience. And that's what we call ordinary awareness. Ordinary awareness is where subject, the quality of Rishi is lost. And that's what essentially we know as that ordinary awareness. Ordinary. Sensory perception, which gives the expression, expressive potentiality for the mind to look for its lost happiness, is being temporarily arrested by pure objectivity of the experience. Every experience then, what it is, nothing more, nothing less. But then there is a shift. And in that shift, in that alignment, the subject 
gains its essentially seed, its driving seed. And then there is a greater witness that there is a possibility to have a different relationship, qualitatively different relationship with the object of experience. And even that is not, not essentially um, a static affair. There is another possibility of subject merging with object, but not in the case of when objectivity dominates awareness. What dominates awareness then, it's pure experiencing. It's a very different affair. It's when subject and object temporarily reconciled. One essentially becomes the other. They annihilate each other. And all is left is pure experiencing. And this you can see it as on a grand scale of the process loosely known as enlightenment. Or you can see it in a daily life as experience of everyone. Because it is there at all times, always. There is this modality shift. <coughs> they just shift. We undergo these changes. Perhaps the overall experience for someone whose awareness is temporarily arrested in the objectivity of the world is dominant because it is considered to be the only reference and the only referential point. It's something that we take for granted, that's what it is. And that leads to that, what we call that limiting and limited perspective. Limiting and limiting in the sense that our own consciousness is being limited on the accord of its kind of objectification. And that objectification is at the cost, of course, of losing, losing, uh, otherwise, our own consciousness in the object of experiencing, in the ob object of experience, whether this is a flower, a shoe, a, a car, you know, or gender, lies. everything, absolutely everything. And also this is why in most spiritual traditions there is this emphasis on regaining the quality of the seer, the quality of the rishi. That prerequisite, prerequisite to gain that witnessing state of consciousness as that platform where one can camp, one can relax even if temporarily, because at least that what allows one to have a greater relationship with everything, because there is a witness. If our consciousness is gulloped down, swallowed by object, any object, then very little, very little possibilities for being able to know this experience in its true essence, in its true nature. It becomes a matter of fact. And that's what it means to live on a horizontal plane of existence. That's what it means to be kind of pushed out into that horizontal level where the magnanimity of the ocean is no longer lived, the magnanimity of our essence is no longer experienced. Instead, we are subjected to these surface waves, surface waves that constantly, constantly move and flicker. And once that subject is in a driving seat, once that subject is gained, this creates 
a ground where literally we can grow into finer levels of consciousness or expand into finer level of consciousness. Yes, they are present, but something dominates the awareness. It has to. I mean, if I say the three, I don't. I mean, the three states of uh, Buddha. Try again. You say there is three states where one of the three dominates. <clears throat> and I'm wondering if that can be, if those three states can be so separate from each other, or if they not like. a certain level coexisting everything is coexisting of course everything is coexisting mm -hmm. everything everything is coexisting elements have their unique if you will structure molecular structure right that physical structure at the same time we also know that each element contained in another element. So if, if you want to understand it, maybe that's kind of like a little bit of infusion of that alchemy would, would be helpful. So you don't get sort of too... Um, yeah, like you don't have this dry understanding that somehow there's one, the other, and the other, and they... Uh, of course, the one has the other in itself, because all is contained by that, what this is. They don't have existence of their own. And the example with the elements, the earth contains all five elements in itself. The earth contains all five elements in itself. And so is ether. Ether contains all five elements, otherwise how can elemental order come out of ether? Ether, as that, space, contains all five elements. Perfectly. Perfectly in its pure potentiality and out of sound, within the ether, all the elements, elements are projected outwards, as it were. In the same way, in the same way, each element contains not just the preceding element out of which it is born, but all five of them. No? And yet, when you look at the fire, it's very different from water. Now just look at it. Just look at it. Open your eyes now. <laughs> look here. You see? They look very different. They have different molecular structure, unique appearance, and yet one is contained in, in, in the other. So, of course, it would be the same with the subject, object, and experiencing. So, don't worry about trying to really locate and have this precise understanding gradually grow into this. Open up to it. And you will see how it will begin, begin, essentially sink in, based on your direct experience. Because, of course, we are not done with this. We are not done with this discourse. There's more to it. Because it's not that somehow objective experience is a mistake or error in consciousness. It's not. Therefore, some traditions are more unapologetic in the way they explicitly convey something. Explicitly convey something. It's out of its own will that Shiva loses, loses 
Okay, if I'll say himself, someone will be offended again. Right? Obviously, Shiva is not a gender-bound creature. So pure awareness loses itself in this, what otherwise, form of Shiva. Awareness is lost to the objectivity of the worldly experience, not because it's some kind of error in creation. There's no way for Shiva to enjoy that what is come out of his own heart. Likewise, likewise, in the same way the Shivahood is regained only when the world comes to an end. That's why Shiva is equated with the ultimate, ultimate power of annihilation. You cannot know Shiva, it's like you cannot eat your, have your cake and eat it. So this is why don't yet try to put all the dots on the E. Leave some room, leave some space in this understanding. This is given to you for your consideration to sort of going back to the theme of that Trinity, the Christian Trinity, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit. So you have an additional perspective to consider. Only from that. And of course that helps you to understand what already you've been exposed to in terms of the, this tantric or Vedic perspective, which is interlinked anyway, because tantras come from Vedas. The tantra itself is born out of the fourth Veda, from the Atharva Ved. This is the provenance of tantra. Way before the tantra is born, historically as it were, round around the fourth to the sixth century of the common era. So it's that trinity of experience is what makes the experience possible. The trinity of all together, togetherness that Samhita of Rishi Devata Chan does. Cessation of that, there will be no experience. Cessation of that will be a total withdrawal. There will be no experience whatsoever. No one to attribute that experience. This is the unknowing nature of self-realization when we speak ultimately about that process. This is why it is not an error in language or incorrect way to say that no one gets realized. It's an oxymoron to say someone got enlightened. Utter oxymoron. Because that would presuppose that an object or subject somehow got enlightened. <coughs> so just that, you know, always, always, when you try to understand something, there is ways, and I gave you examples before. It's like trying to grasp the quicksilver, you know? It's just like, you, as much as you, but cup your hands. Mm -hmm. You know, cup your hand like that. And it will all gather in a single ball, as a drop. Mm -hmm. See? This versus this. It's kind of more humble approach. This So let's leave this for a moment. Let's leave this, this topic for a moment and maybe go back to purely uh, uh, Christian analogies and Christian perspectives, or perspectives that are present in, 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 this, in, in this tradition. In a way, it is interesting to see how certain uh, trajectories of how certain um, 
obviously in the fragmentation of the of that original way of origin, original teaching how the gravity would be towards something you know this is why some intellectuals um, this is why some seekers of truth very often gravitated to what they have considered more ancient perspectives present in Christianity. And I'm not saying that that necessarily is going into the very essence of the teaching, but this is, I know that for sure, that there was a whole movement, even in England, in the UK, sometimes in the 60s and the early 70s, where people who were born into the Christian background, with a Catholic background, a Protestant background, they looked to the East, or Eastern branches of this tradition, to where that perspective, where this kind of like line of that tradition essentially held very close to that, the importance of the Holy Trinity. The importance of the Holy Trinity in Greek Orthodox and Uniats, it's the branch of the Greek Orthodox Church that existed in Ukraine. Mm. Where this remained intact. And that relationship, the Trinity, iconographically represented by three essentially genderless figures. So even when we say Father, like if you look at the that famous icon by Byzantine Russian painter, Trinity, it's called. It's in Tretiakov Gallery. Just Google and look at it. It's a marvelous work of art, beautiful, an amazing piece. It's just three figures. And it's very hard to tell who is the Father, who is the Son, who is the Holy Spirit there. They all look approximately of the same ageless age. They all equally genderless. <coughs> they all, all look quite transcendently beatific. <laughs> and so it gives you that flavor of these modalities with which the painter was equipped when he was painted it within the given tradition. What was the name of the painter? Painter. Painter Andrei Rublev. There is something tempting to also introduce, even though in danger of being persecuted, mm -hmm. is that, um, you know, the Father gives birth to the Son, and the Son gives birth to the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit gives birth to the Father. You see that equilateral is completely locked into itself now. How is it possible even? It's, it's total, total bizarre situation here. <laughs> <laughs> the Father is not the Son, the Son is not the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is not the Father. This is where you enter the non-linear thinking, which is required. It's a prerequisite in spiritual growth. The linearity, linearity has to be broken. 
This is why in, on the very first evening when we sat here, when we were trying to delve and define present, present was not, was not a current experience or current fragmented experience that is marked or sandwiched between the past and the future. It's a very narrow definition of the present. Present is that what contains it all, always contains it all. In other words, if you immediately translate it into yourself, you contain it all right away as you are here. Every experience that you have contains it all. There is no past for you, there is no future, mm -hmm. if you truly understand what that present is and what you embody. It's the first, first dive into the immortal waters of your own self. This is what it means to be truly alive. Because you die to that what you consider yourself to be as temporal reality. You die to that. That has to be annihilated. One way or the other. We can tiptoe with the spirituality. We can, you know... You want to enjoy it? You take it from the tray into the mouth and have it a good go at it. <laughs> or otherwise, suck that almond nut for the rest of your life somewhere stuffed behind your cheek, you know, anticipating how it will taste one day. But I'm already done with this metaphor. Let's move to the next one. <laughs> So, one way or the other, this is the understanding, this is the understanding, that the present is not just something that I'm now experiencing and then I'm up for more important things. This is where the stillness comes from, the true sense of essentially where all that eagerness is out of the window. This is the meaning of the darshan, is to seeing and beholding your true form, which is formless, timeless, eternal, ever-present. Ever-present. Again, we're back to that category. It cannot be equated, because it is not defined by what happened in the past and what yet to happen. It is only defined from that horizontal plane of experience, but it is not defined mm -hmm. or it's not defining that who is the only experiencer here. Okay, I've told that story before, but I will repeat it again. <coughs> Because it's a very beautiful story. And though it may sound so innocently blasé, you know, like even, oh, not deep enough, it's profound. In one of his travels around the world, in the early 60s, there was this encounter when Maharishi, in front of the audience, was asked by a child, you know, like, I don't know, early teens, whatever, child, there's a child's voice, um, Maharishi, if um, God has created man, who has created God? And Maharishi, usually quite cheerful, gone quiet for a moment. And closed his eyes. When he opened his eyes, he quite seriously said, Man. This is the sphere of mutual interaction. This is to understand there's no God out there. This is to understand that this is the same treatment Christ receives as the Buddha. This is entering the really, really cross. This is where you reconcile the horizontal and vertical planes of reality in your own being. The essence of Christianity. The symbol of the cross. at the epicenter of your own heart. That place, literally the place of crossing, is the heart of it all.
No one, not someone else's, your own heart is the place of that reconciliation, is the essence of Christianity, it's the essence of the teaching of Christ. You are that essence. Each and every one of you is already Christian to your bone marrows. And that's the only reconciliation of the original sin. The sin is not knowing here. The sin is not knowing. Being kicked out of the Garden of Eden is because the knowledge is lost. It's a totally different way of interpreting it than what it was told to us. It's not because they ate from the tree of knowledge and somehow lost their innocence. It's simply, simply taking, taking what takes place on the level of horizontal experience for the knowledge is the sin. There's only, only, one and the only. There's no other sin. Therefore, reconciliation of that sin is Christ consciousness. That's why Christ is the Savior. Christ literally as your own consciousness. Your own consciousness, that's what Christ stands for. In any way and in every way. So this is the enigmatic relationship between subject-object <coughs> and experiencing. The Rishi Devata and Chandas. Where the concept of God itself is born out of that relationship. One gives birth to another for the sake of that literally dynamic. For the sake of that dynamic interaction. <coughs> 